Hello and welcome everyone to our VistaTech Life Sciences in Focus podcast, fascinating conversations with global life sciences experts. This is a space where we interview uh, life sciences experts once a month and I'm your host today, Karen Katchik. I'm excited to talk with our guest this month, Reem Yunus, who is currently a consultant to the life sciences space with multidisciplinary interests that we're going to hear all about. Reem and I met at the DIA Global uh, Conference earlier in 2024 and immediately connected and uh, are keeping up the conversation. So let's dive in. It's a pleasure for, you, for me to have you here today. Please tell us, tell everyone listening a little bit about your origin story. Hey, well, uh, Karen, thank you so much. And yes, indeed, it was such a lovely uh, meeting uh, to meet you then and at the DIA. We had fun <laughs> at the reception. Um, and thank you for that opportunity. It is lovely. Uh, so a little bit of my origin. So I'm a, a scientist, a scientist by training. I um, obtained a, my, my PhD in genetics. And... Uh, I look at it and, and, you know, it's a genetics, but when I look at it and closer, <laughs> my degree was in quantitative genetics, looking at uh, DNA uh, markers that are associated with gene uh, control for an immune response to infectious diseases. It's like, whoa, <laughs> that's a lot. So I'm mentioning that because it's, it is indeed what, uh, a multidisciplinary um, um, graduate uh, training. And I've, and again, reflecting on my career, I found myself that I actually always engage in that multidisciplinary um, uh, research. Wherever I go, it entails getting into projects that bring different facets or disciplines of science into the project. And that what makes it really fascinating to be in, 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 the, in research. And that is, uh, you know, the thinking, the approach um, continued with me when I made the shift to more of the clinical trial space, the clinical research or clinical trial. And because of that, an, an understanding that you know, problem is very, it is, it's multi-layered, multi, you, you need different disciplines in order to really understand a problem. Uh, and you need to bring those disciplines together, which in, in research, they all translate to data. So you need to bring those multiple, multi-layered data into your research. And clinical trials is, is, is not different from, say, basic sciences. You really have to look at it in a multifaceted. And that's where we're heading to. And uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating. So you started in genetics, you started in the lab, and then uh, you moved into clinical research. Tell us something about the jobs that you've had, the various places you've got, either your employers or the various things you've had that have led you now to where you are right now? So at one point, I decided I don't want to stay at the bench. I want to take, um, recognize that I have the skills and continue, continue to do, you know, um, stay in the science and the research space. And um, clinical research and clinical trials was the sort of like um, a natural thing to transition, I you know, recognizing there's a lot, huge overlap of, you know, of the skills that, that I, you know, I built or acquired throughout my basic science uh, uh, training and work. So I decided to go into the clinical trials space or research space. I have to say at the time when I made that decision to transition, it was not an easy transition. Coming from basic science, a lot of people looked at us like, oh, well, I don't know, what, what are you? Who are you? <laughs> and what about your skills? Like, oh, you we do these things. And, and for me, it was like, okay, hey, you, you know, you will look at those uh, skills and then ABC, I have them saying one, two, three, but they're, they're relevant and they're transferable. So... 
you know, it was not uh, an easy sort of, you know, finding those people who actually could recognize that, that these are transferable skills. And, uh, but then I was able to venture into the clinical space. I think it started with a startup company. Uh, it's always, uh, I think, a little bit easier because with a startup company coming from, uh, especially someone who's doing multidisciplinary work, you would be able to do wear multiple hats and do many different things. So, yeah. Yes, that's much harder in a large biopharma where you're going to be more pigeonholed and have a particular role, goal, single thing. And I can see why um, someone like you who likes to connect the prop, the dots and do some lateral problem solving is 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 suited to the startup world. Yes, uh, definitely. Yeah. I think when uh, we were talking the other day, I mentioned like, you know, I I look again, I look where uh, at my career and I see my track and it's like a zigzag track. Whereas, you know, at one point I was comparing to some of my friends who sort of went linear in their track and mine is uh, like, I say that, that uh, the constant in my track is not being consistent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't had many conversations with, uh, let's say, women our age who've had linear careers uh, recently. A lot of us have had some zigzags, some, um, you know, mine is unusual as well, but it has some constants. Yeah. So I'm always interested in finding those constants, the thread that it, that has that has can followed you through that unusual path. Um, and 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 you've you nailed it when you said it's the multidisciplinary approach. It's the mm -hmm. it's the data plus the science plus the this plus the that. It's and, and that's that's where you are are happy connecting the puzzle pieces. So right now you're consulting for a number of companies. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I am. It's uh, different things. <laughs> so you're um, feeding that need for thinking about all sorts of different things at once. And I bet that that all, all that, diff all the work and the different projects with different clients is supporting your ideas for all of them. Right. Yes. So I, with that, you know, going back to that multidisciplinary, I feel very comfortable when I am sitting at intersectionality of disciplines, because I can, I'm not um, like deep in one thing. I'm I know enough to be able to connect to other disciplines and bring it together because it it's a continuum. It's not one thing or the other. They are interconnected, and um, <clears throat> and that's so, how you innovate, uh, right? Forgive yes. me for interrupting. Right, no. that's how innovative yeah. innovative ideas come from thinking Absolutely. like you do right Absolutely. so so I say like you know I sit in that intersection of uh, or intersectionality of technology data and science I have you know I, I, the principles of a scientist like how to approach a, a problem and a scientific problem I'm comfortable with data again my my graduate studies had a lot of data in it so I had to deal with with big data with statistical uh, methodologies and uh, and also the the technologies now we're you know I said also in Silicon Valley so <laughs> yes I was going to so so let me ask you a question about that so um in life sciences I think it's fair to say as a generalization mm -hmm. that we are not um that we are risk averse and that the digital transformation is still a thing, right? There yes. are so many yeah. years behind the tech industry. So you're surrounded with tech innovation where you are based. Um, mm -hmm. How have you seen, are you seeing life sciences catch up? There, are you th how, talk to us a little bit about that. Um, and perhaps specifically, if we're talking about clinical research, we now are not only talking about the randomized clinical trial. We're talking about real world data and real world evidence. Absolutely. I'd love to hear how you see the life sciences industry uh, adapting there. It's, it's getting there, but it's not 
yet there. Although, so the real world data uh, um, and real world evidence guide, uh, guidance or guideline came, uh, like the FDA released that in, I think it went in 2018 and another update. And actually just recently in July, another update to the right. real world. So this has been there because of the, the, the recognizing the need of enriching data. You cannot just continue to do a randomized clinical trial in a certain way. So we have to shift the paradigm. But there was not a lot of adoption for that because of concerns. How are you going to handle the data that is coming from these sources? And so there was a felt like, you know, talking to people and, you know, there is a push um, against it in a way, well, we can do that for those things, but not really for running a trial to generate evidence about around the safety and efficacy of the, the, the say the medical uh, investigation or medical product, where is be it a drug or a medical device or a treatment. Um, so, but then, okay, that's that. And then, uh, decentralized clinical trials. You know, again, another layer say, hey, we want to incorporate, do research where we can actually increase in, in, in enrollment, recruitment, bring the trial to the patients themselves, make it more convenient because we're really hurting in terms of recruitment. We do not get to the to the numbers we you know we we aim for or it takes longer time so so these were all you know trying to solve the problem for how we run clinical trials but if you think about it and now just that last week um actually the, the FDA re released the guidance for the DCT the centralized clinical right. trial and also an, uh, um, a draft guidance for running clinical trials, randomized clinical trials at point of care, and you know, as part of, uh, yeah. So these are really good initiatives. I think it's softened uh, the the path to uh, to start thinking differently about how we generate evidence. I say we, you know, these are good, but we are ready. <laughs> Because the the technological advancements where we're sitting sitting now, we can actually do these things because there's the technology to get support all, you know, that shift in in doing um, you know generating evidence or running clinical trials in a way that we can actually get really robust data from those trials. Um, so always, you know, regulatory, of course, uh, comes in and, uh, you know, the people think about, like, how, how are we going to ensure that these are, um, you know, being um, adhered to all the regulatory um, uh, frameworks and, and, and regulations or laws. Um, but I, I always think about it like, okay, randomized clinical trials, um, and that ties to that transformation. When I was at Medable, I you know, wanted to help bring that transformation to the space. If you think about you know, randomized clinical trials, there are, it's a model of the 1940s. And it's and you know, a model that is, yeah, was suitable for the for the scientific advancements then. We, we thought then, you know, science thought that diseases are more of a population-based um, um, disease, like, you know, it's a, driven by genetics. And so you can have, you look at it as a pie in, in the population. And that's why the statistical are, you know, behind those, um, the clinical trials are population-based statistics. But we are like almost, what, 80 years? <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe years later, and uh, and we're still doing those, you know, following that model. When through those eighty years, we have such an advancement in how we we actually understand diseases, and we there is you know the data science. It's not just statistics or statistical methodologies embedded in the data science, but there's advancements in data science, and there are advancements in technologies that can support. The data could support, um, you know, how we capture data, 
So how can we bring all those together to actually change that paradigm? And that's what I feel like very passionate about. How can we change the, change the paradigm of how we generate uh, evidence around the safety and efficacy of um, of a certain, say, drug or treatment or or medical device. So, and you know, I always try to kind of like look at it as an onion and peel back the the layers and and connect to that. You know, often you see that people think of clinical trials separate from actually the healthcare ecosystem and what happens. But that's, it's not the case. You know, you, you, you develop a, say, well, let's stick to drug as an example, and you bring it to the market and it's gonna be used in the healthcare systems, like in the real world practice. And what we see often that, you know, a drug that um, was approved showed efficacy in the clinical randomized clinical trials, when they hit the market and used in the practice, they're not as effective. So, so let's you know, talk about that, how to <laughs> close that gap between efficacy yeah, so you have and efficacy effectiveness. Effective. Exactly, efficacy to effectiveness gap, you have that. So there are three major play or factors that feed into that gap. One that, you know, the, the patient population it's very heterogeneous, it's a, that's the heterogeneity. And now it's not only genetic heterogeneity, but also where we grow up, where we eat, you know, social determinants of health, how we, you know, on, do things on a daily basis that feed into our, our health. And we know that, you know, our environmental factors impact our genetics with that, you know, through the epigenetics. So that's one, one, one uh, major factor. The other one, the disease itself, it's not a single pathway. There is also heterogeneity in the etiology of diseases. So if we might have the same disease, but there could be different pathways that are leading to the same disease. So we're not the, you know, the same. And the third one uh, is heterogeneity in, in how we practice medicine even under the standard of care, because you know different providers or healthcare system have their own processes in place. And all of that you know, lead to heterogeneity in data. Um, so, so how can we actually close that, close that gap? Enrich the data, the real world data, bring in more real world data into um, you know, when we generate evidence. Um, again, those guidances are, are, are really good. I think it, it provides some help to the industry, to the life science uh, industry that are more risk averse. Oh, the FDA is comfortable with that. So let's, let's venture. So that's good. <laughs> it's helpful so, for those companies that uh, unfortunately need a nudge to do the right thing, a regulatory shove in, in the right yeah. direction, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I have That's to. The, it's the real world that exactly. some some companies are and players are going to be innovative and ahead of the game, and others are not. Others are going to require that push. So, so going back now, looking at it from the technology uh, side of things and how technology can help. So, if you look at real world data, real world data scattered or um, in many different databases, like you know, owners of data, EMRs, you know, diagnostic labs, imaging wearables, all of that. And uh, if you go and ask, hey, I'd like to access your data to enrich my data, there's a lot of hesitation around sharing data in, in the healthcare ecosystem. And why is that? And rightfully so, it's concerns around you know, data safety, breaches and all of that, and uh, patient privacy. But now we're talking about technologies that can help with that remove those obstacles, like um, federated learning. Like we, you know, more and more people are adopting the uh, tokenization to bring in real world data. But that, you know, 
this is a great um, starting point, and in some cases, it's very suitable, and what in other cases is is not because it has its limitation. You know, there's a, um, a technology called homomorphic encryption, where it, where yeah, we all know about encryption that we encrypt data at uh, at rest or at transit when we you know the database is 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 closed. It's the data could be encrypted. And then, or when you send an, you know, uh, an email or, or information uh, that uh, that get in, encrypted to protect it when it's being sent. But um, what about, um, you know, you can actually, what happens in, is that when you need to access the data, and analyze it or process it, you have to open it up. Basically, it has to be in a plain text in order to be analyzed. And that all becomes you know, a point of vulnerability for the data. So, but that's a homomorphic encryption, which is not a new concept. It was like in the 1970s, but there was issues with like, you know, how to advance it and to scale it. But now uh, there is technology that allows that again, computational uh, power that advanced, has advanced allows those technologies to become more, you know, not just accessible, more scalable. And so that homomorphic encryption, you can actually process your data and analyze it while it's in, in its uh, encrypted form. So you don't have to open it up. So that opens really a lot of opportunities in the space to share data, to access data, to collaborate even between, you know, companies that um, could benefit from enriching their own data set, but they're concerned about, say, IP or other um, issues, they could actually collaborate because, hey, I can do, I can access your data. I don't, I will not see the raw data. I will not see what, you know, what you have, but I can get the results from the analysis. So that's a, a higher level. Um, and okay, so now, okay, if you break that, now you have all that data, say it's accessible, people are very comfortable accessing the data, but these are data that are different types of data, uh, different structures. How can you actually use all of that, all of that data to generate evidence? Well, guess what? We are in the data sciences. We have that multimodal approaches to data. And technology allows that to, you know, the infrastructure to allow uh, looking and analyzing in a multimodal uh, form or format of those data. So the technologies is, are there, and I think we're ready to do that. I have to say there are a few companies that are doing that, like from discovery, because a lot of people are now talking about, you know, AI and, and, and drug discovery, LLMs and all of that. This is again, it's fascinating and it's uh, it's uh, it's it's amazing. But the use, the utilization of it, I feel like some people look at it at just at one area that you can they feel comfortable. Oh yeah, we can use that in this area, but now they're in their it, own swim lane. They're not thinking intersectionally exactly. like you, right? Yeah, but that actually could you know those AI into what is AI? I mean, these are technologies that are based on artificial intelligence, but you can apply it in many different you know on that continuum. And and there are companies who are doing that. A few startup companies that are looking at um, using this multimodal approaches to from discovery to, I say discovery to delivery, basically to generate evidence around, yeah, you discovered a drug, you're testing it, and then eventually um, submitting it for, for approval. So, and if you think about it, the need for it, we're talking about personalized medicine. I mean, this is also to go back to that eff efficacy to effectiveness gap, the use of real-world data and connecting it to the ecosystem. You have also, I would say, there are three Ps: the patient, the pay, the provider, and the payer. You bring your drug again. We'll stick to the drugs to the market, and now because of the cost of of um, you know bringing a, a drug to the market is so expensive in the billions of dollars. I mean, there are some stat around like you know figures of two north of $2 billion, 
you bring it in, it's very expensive. Now the patient, even if they are covered, <laughs> they have still to participate and pay part of that, uh, you know, uh, to cover their portion. They would ask, is it worth, like, you know, you're asking me to pay so much money for that. Is Does that drug work for in me, like in, in patients like me? And the, pro, the provider would say, okay, hey, I'm going to subject my patient to a really financial hardship. Is, does this really work for them? Does it work for people like them, that demographics, this profile of patient? And then the payer would say, yeah, hold on. If I'm paying, covering, say, 80% of that uh, drug cost, does it really work for that patient? So now you have to actually look at the patient and say, what is, what is the makeup of that patient? And that's personalized medicine. Everyone is asking, you know, want it to be effective in me if I'm paying so much. You cannot just prescribe me a medicine and, and you know, something that wouldn't work for me. Uh, so again, looking at it at more holistically and, and that's data. <laughs> you need the data. Sure is. Yeah. So as I'm sure the listeners can tell, we could talk forever, Ever. but we <laughs> should wrap this up because <laughs> nobody likes podcasts that last forever. So is there anything uh, before we go, is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners, any other activity involvement that you have, anything else you'd like to share a closing thought? Uh, I think, you know, to still be open-minded for, you know, for what the technologies and the advancements in science and, you know, are bringing and be and, and challenge the status quo. Start thinking of like, hey, that's an old paradigm. Let's shift it. Let's change it. Uh, and again, I actually am happy to see those guidelines. That could give a little bit of reassurance for those hesitants, you know, the hesitancies that we see in, in the life sciences. Uh, maybe that would be like, yeah, okay, the FDA is okay with it, comfortable with it. Let's, yeah. let's think of yeah. doing it. So, yeah, no, that's... Uh, I think we're really in a very exciting times. Um, yeah. Yeah, we certainly um, are. We're seeing movement in a lot of places where we weren't seeing movement only a few years ago, right? Certainly pre-pandemic, right? Things have shifted. So that's yeah. keeping you busy. Keeping yeah. you busy. Well, yeah. thank you so much Reem, for your insights and to our audience. Thank this... you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my great pleasure. This, this, uh, this Life Sciences and Focus podcast is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and other leading platforms, as well as YouTube, if you'd like to watch us in conversation rather than listen. Please make sure to tune, again, tune in again next month for Vista Tech Life Sciences and Focus, fascinating conversations with global life sciences experts. <laughs>